All right. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Brian, the founder of Medicine Box, and I have a very special guest with us today, uh, a friend and, and colleague, Marissa Nordstrom, um, in all the way in New Mexico. It's a bit windy there today, apparently. And um, this is a really exciting conversation to be had. Um, the first time Marissa and I talked, it was a scheduled call for 15 minutes. And I think we ended up talking for almost two hours. Uh, just went really deep uh, in our personal lives and how we've both been able to transform personal experiences into uh, a professional uh, passion or purpose that we've uh, been pursuing um, individually. And uh, from a place of real traumatic experiences as well as uh, sovereign experience. And uh, Marissa, uh, MA, is based in uh, Corrales, New Mexico on the ancestral homelands of the Tiwesh Pueblo people. She uses her background in communications, project management, and entrepreneurship, as well as intuitive abilities to help you articulate your career vision, own your brand, clarify messaging, and frame a professional life based on your priorities. Marissa is an introvert who has overcome many life challenges and knows what it is like to feel stuck. She works best with people who are seeking to live more authentically, use their life for good, and ready to invest in their own transformation. Her business is centered on the values of social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Transformational experiences can be defined as experiences that fundamentally challenge a person's assumptions and preconceptions, as well as their beliefs and values affecting how they understand themselves, others, and the world. After experiencing a series of challenging life experiences culminating with the traumatic loss of her spouse, Marissa Nordstrom found her purpose and learned to show up for her love fearlessly with her whole heart and created a business centered around the values of social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. With an in-depth approach, including pre-work and assessment, coaching, interview practice, action planning, and resources, Marissa provides a balance of intuitive insights, grounded support, and pragmatic tools to help people discover the deeper longings underneath, which could be as simple as what the person would really like to be known for or as complicated as a complete career change. And as the founder of Medicine Box, one of the things I've gotten really clear on is our mission. And that is to co-create sovereignty and human health and happiness while harmonizing a relationship with Mother Earth. And one of the quotes, and mantras, I think daily wisdoms that Marissa lives by uh, that really have, has caught my attention is quote, I am the sovereign governor of my own experience. And that is really going to be the uh, precipice. Uh, I think that's going to guide this conversation and we'll be weaving uh, in the fabric of the words that uh, Marissa and I are going to be speaking about. But before we get into uh, a lot of the, the, the story and the background of Marissa, um, I have this very nice book that I read every morning. It's called Mindful Morning. And I picked it up this morning and uh, did the, the reading uh, one passage a day. And I felt it was very potent to share with you all because it made me think of the conversation that we're about to have. And uh, it's titled, Try Not to Fix the World. And I know that's a, a difficult uh, concept because a lot of us are trying to fix the world and we're trying to do good work out there and be good stewards of the environment and uh, socially responsible with our fellow humans. But uh, the underlying message here is uh, when you get out of the driver's seat, you find that life can drive itself, that actually life has always been driving itself. Life becomes almost magical. The illusion of the quote, me, is no longer in the way. Life begins to flow and you never know where it will take you. 
And those beautiful words are written by Adia Shante, author and spiritual teacher. And um, if you all want to join me here and Marissa, I'm just going to close her eyes and uh, we're going to do a little box breathing technique that kind of relaxes our nervous system, uh, allows us to really receive the information uh, that we're about to learn and hear. And also just really just put the worries of the, the day behind you and try to get into the, the moment here. So we're going to do three rounds of a four, seven, eight uh, box breathing technique that I like to do. It's a big inhale uh, for four seconds. We hold it for seven and then exhale for eight. Uh, we'll do that three times and then we'll come in to the conversation with Marissa. So uh, let's uh, do a three, two, one deep breath in four seconds. I'm gonna hold for seven. Three. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale, eight. One more inhale. Exhale. All right, that should bring us all into the present moment. I'm feeling super grounded. Uh, I got some tea. Everyone, you get some drinks and um, relax into this amazing conversation. Uh, so Marissa, um, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, that quote, I am the sovereign governor of my own experience. I feel there's a lot to unpack in those words. And um, if you wanna just jump into uh, your background and kind of what has put you into the precipice of the uh, uh, work that you're doing right now. Sure. Well, uh, in relation to that, that particular mantra, that was something that came up for me when I worked in healthcare and I was working in a cancer center. And, you know, I was just having a lot of um, I guess you would just say stress about was I doing the right job? Was I, you know, in the right place? I would, you know, was I missing out on some other thing I should be doing somewhere like in California, you know, like <laughs> more exciting. Um, and I just realized at one point, you know, when I was working with a coach that so much of my experience was dictated by these narratives that were just cycling through my brain and those were serving as a filter for all that I was experiencing. And so I came to this realization that, you know, it's me that makes the meaning here. And, and the other piece of the puzzle is that I would ask myself, could someone else be in this exact circumstance and have a different experience of it? And the answer to that is always, Yes, you know, someone else could be in this exact job and be filled with overwhelming gratitude and, you know, so thankful that that they're uh, working in this cancer center and, you know, you are focused on, um, you know, this idea that you're missing out on things. So I kind of came to this conclusion that I'm always in the right place at the right time. And essentially, I'm the one that's making meaning of the experience. And I'm going to choose to feel good and have this kind of attitude of fully showing up and being present where I am and honoring the people that I'm with and continuing to learn and grow and not resisting, um, I guess you would say not resisting the reality that I'm in, but rather acknowledging that this is where, I'm, where I am and starting there, if that makes any sense. So instead of living always in the future, like I'm not there yet. I started to be here. Mm -hmm. 
and that that really changed everything for for my trajectory. Right, I heard a few words in there: uh, resistance and and choice. And a lot of times, when we're experiencing something uncomfortable or something that we haven't already uh, constructed the outcome of yet, and it's going against what we thought, uh, we can. Um, certainly try to resist that feeling. And it sounds like, you know, you've put a lot of practice into allowing um, whatever you're experiencing to just happen in that moment yeah. without any resistance around it. And uh, myself, I can really um, resonate with that as a person in recovery from drugs and alcohol and uh, acceptance is the answer to all my problems today, all our problems today, because nothing, absolutely nothing happens in the universe, creator, source, divine, God's world by mistake. It's all happening for a reason. And um, you've been able to turn your, uh, the story of trauma and, and recovery uh, into uh, something great that is grounded in the present moment. And I think uh, I know a lot of our listeners and myself included, would love to uh, hear what that uh, traumatic experience was, because I think so many of us do experience trauma in our life, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and uh, there's shame around it. And, you know, Americans have been so stoic about not wanting to be vulnerable or not wanting to be authentic or genuinely express ourselves and be open about these traumatic experiences um, that have happened to us. And now more than ever, I think one of the underlying messages of the, even the coronavirus was people are starting to really come out of their shells and, and express themselves more and uh, realize that we don't need to be filled with shame and guilt and those low vibrational feelings that can really bring us down into um, victim mode and, you know, have us reconstructing the past and designing the future outcome, which is not in the here and now, which you speak of. So um, let's talk about how you were able to transcend the st uh, your story of trauma and, and come into a place of uh, recovery. Yeah, let me just think of a, a good place to start with that. Um, I think I think where I'm going to start is you know, I just want to put a, a framework here for for the situation, which is to say, you know, I really believe that because our country is based on, you know, white supremacy and exploitation of other human beings and, you know, so many different historical things that have happened that have been uh, generationally traumatic, um, all of us are impacted by that. Like all of us are oppressed by that. And when you look at the capitalist system of, you know, where people are working in it and being paid to do certain jobs, I think what a lot of us forget is, you know, it's an oppressive framework. Like it, it's just really, really hard and it causes a lot of stress. I think, especially uh, for men, because a lot of times they are conditioned to identify themselves as valuable because of their ability to provide, you know, for their family or what have you, or to just be successful and manly about it, I guess. And so the reason that I think it's important to bring that up is that my ex-husband had a lot of um, issues that related to that, like in relation to his um, never quite feeling like the status of the job he had was enough to be proud of, even though, you know, I feel like he had a lot to be proud of. Um, it was a really great example of how that's an internal game. You know, that that is not something that no matter how much I might say something to him, he has his own stuff. And if he doesn't work on that stuff, he's just always going to feel inadequate and kind of have an edge. And so in him, that ended up manifesting in depression after we were divorced a few years. And he ended up, you know, taking um, some different medications and they all essentially combined to um, 
really have his his mental state spin out of control and he ended up dying by suicide um and it and it was just incredibly shocking and and dramatic and he he was um actually missing for two months um and then because we still had a good uh relationship as co-parents and so forth he actually turned to me to help manage his estate. Like he sent me the note and all sorts of papers and so forth. And so it just really came out of nowhere in some ways. Um, and yet upon reflecting, you could kind of see that there was a trajectory of, of him not, uh, not getting the mental health support that, that he needed. Um, but for me, it was, you know, for me and our daughter, who at the time had just turned 13, it was essentially a complete earthquake uh, for our lives. And I ended up going on leave from my job and uh, just not having the capacity to go back to the cancer center. And, you know, every Everybody deals with these types of things in uh, different ways. Some people jump right back into work and distract themselves and stuff. But for me, I actually just went right into it. Like I was like, this is an earthquake. Like our life as we knew it is over. And my number one priority was, you know, basically to support my daughter and her mental health and uh, to address the needs of the estate and um, basically recalibrate myself and that just took quite a while. Um, it took about a couple of years actually to work through all of the things in our life that were disrupted by this. Um, so that that's kind of the short story. Um, and so it was only just maybe six months ago, this happened in May of 2018. So it was only six months ago that I felt like I finally had the capacity again to work with other people and to hold space for other people and um, help other people basically process, you know, whatever challenges that they have. Um, and that's how I came to, you know, start the business that I have. Thanks for sharing that, Marissa. Uh, I can, I can relate like something you said about um, your, uh, ex-husband there is that men I think have been so conditioned to be the providers be the fixers be stoic with their emotions and we oftentimes get wrapped up in our identity with our career uh, the money that we're making in that material world that we live in and keeping up with the Joneses and I was reading an article the other day on addiction and recovery and mental health, actually, and uh, something that I am very passionate about and, and keep up on. And it was uh, an interesting meme. It was, uh, you know, being that curious child and being empathic and compassionate and having that beginner's mind that your children just have. And then we go through school and uh, we often get wrapped up in our grades and academics and place so much value on our grades and academics, which personally, that's what I did. And then, you know, getting out of college, it was like, well, what do I have to place my any value on right now? I didn't have a passion. I didn't find purpose in anything other than partying and drinking and having a good time. And that was what ultimately filled my void. So uh, I can t totally relate to that. And I think that's a big reason why I really wanted to have you on this, um, on this podcast was to, you know, bring light to the situation that a lot of humans experience is mm -hmm. that our identities are often wrapped up into things that aren't really that meaningful. And when they get taken away from us, we don't really know what to do. And you did bring up a, a, a solid point too with a lot of men. I, I do know a lot of men that are, are struggling with finding what that passion is or uh, a purpose to pursue. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> do you work with um, predominantly women or do you uh, 
work with men as well to help, you know, bring some of this knowledge uh, to, you know, both females and, and men and any real gender at this junction in our world. Yes, um, definitely everybody. Um, so it, you know, for whatever reason, uh, my clients are more frequently women, but it isn't, it isn't necessarily, um, you know, anything that I try to control for. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the, the approach that I take, and I think part of why I, you know, could potentially be very, very helpful to men is that, you know, they often have trouble putting words to things. So it's not that the feelings are not there. It's just, it can be really hard sometimes to express things. And it isn't that I come at this as a therapist, um, but I do think it's really important to, you know, basically be aligned in your, in yourself to the extent that it's possible when you're looking at a job search or you're looking at a career change or, Maybe you're just unemployed. It's an opportunity to uh, take a step back and really question all the assumptions that you have about, you know, what livelihood is and and what um, what the purpose of work is. There are some more existential questions that can arise, and somehow what I find is. You know, it's not like I pretend to have the answers, but somehow just by asking these questions, mm -hmm. it creates an environment of like, like a safer container that's based in the reality of what we're all confronting instead of just acting like it's not there. Like that, you know, so, so I find that even just raising the questions takes things to another level that allows people's nervous system to calm down and therefore clarity is more likely to arise right uh, from the trauma work that i've done you know, i went through i got sober through the 12-step program eight and a half years ago and they casted a big net to me and reeled me in to the to the boat and got me to the other side of the tumultuous storm that i was living in and the helped me absolve the chaotic relationship with drugs and alcohol that I had. And through that process, I've always been seeking more and more, diving deeper and deeper. And I've done some trauma work. And with the trauma work, you know, like you said, you know, sometimes it's just a question. It's like, it's like mining for gold. You have to mine around some things. And, and oftentimes it can happen very quickly that reality shift can almost happen immediately. And when, you know, as a concierge, uh, I'm thinking it's a, such a clever name, uh, career concierge is, you know, most people know a concierge as a, in a hotel, you know, tell us where to go have fun, where to make dinner reservations, bring us the car to pick us up. And they're mining for information. They're mining for reservations. They're mining for uh, giving you an enjoyable experience. And, is that part of, you know, what's your process when you go through uh, you know, the career concierge and helping people identify, uh, maybe get them on the track, uh, their pathway to discovering what their, their purpose is? Yeah, so essentially for me, uh, where the concierge piece comes in is that I, and I apologize if you can hear me crying, um, somebody just got home and they always lose it. <laughs> um, okay. But essentially, um, the idea is to tailor what I do to the particular person. So much like a concierge is not just going to send everyone to the same restaurant. This is a situation where I uh, do an assessment and work with you to identify um, what out of all the things that I can offer, do you actually need and what would be a benefit to you um, so that I put together a package basically that is specifically for you. It isn't, uh, it isn't like you pick A, B, or C. It's a lot more specific than that. Very, very tailored to the personality and the, the human that you're working with, as well as uh, probably the experiences that they've gone through. Yes. And um, I love that. You know, I, I think when I was, you know, in the, 
I recently left a 12 step program uh, two months ago and it was, uh, it was for my own personal reasons. There's no resentment. There's no, you know, Oh my God, you didn't do what I needed you to do. It was no blame or anything like that, but it was really just to find uh, a newer path of, of discovery and not quite be rooted in the, again, another identity that, you know, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, once an addict, always an addict. And I, I wasn't, you know, through some of the trauma work that I did uh, to help, you know, shift that identity from like, yo, dude, you're going to be okay. Like if you, if you leave, you're going to be fine. You're not going to be bellied up at a bar doing shots of tequila and, uh, you know, blowing off, you know, your whole week. Um, so, uh, where was I going with that? I think it was, uh, people, people are always at humans. We're always seeking truth, even when we don't know that we're seeking truth. And a lot of times that truth comes in the form of this subconscious programming, uh, subconscious identifying with the car, the wife, the husband, the relationship, the house, the likes on Instagram, the, the audience on Instagram, all these really superficial things that take us away from the one fundamental truth that all humans on this earth are really looking for, even when they don't know they're looking for it. Kindness, compassion, empathy, and interconnectedness. Uh, and clarity. And most of us don't have the clarity to get there. And what are, what are some of your processes to, you know, if, if let's role play, if I was your client, how would we get, you know, what would your process do to help me gain clarity to get on that path? Even though I, I have a, a path and a purpose and a lot of passions, but uh, I think I stumbled through a lot of those early years to find my way. And it's so beautiful to see now there's so many people doing great work to help unearth traumas and to help get people into their why, right. And help them find their how behind their why to get to that place. And I hear so many more people now that are quitting their corporate jobs. They're leaving behind, you know, law school, they're dropping out of master's, programs. Uh, they're not even going to college anymore because they've found something that they want to pursue and they're leaving, you know, leaving normal behind. There's actually a brand called that leaving normal behind. Um, so not everyone is fortunate, maybe like us to have turned our trauma into an experience that we want to give back to the world. So how do you go through that process of uh, clarifying uh, with, you know, individual people that you work with to kind of nudge them on that path. You're not going to build the path for them, but you're showing them the way. So what's that process look like? Um, well, that's a very good question. And of course, I'm going to say it varies um, based on where the person comes from, uh, because you know, just to give you an example, recently I worked with an engineer, you know, from Silicon Valley who does, you know, three different forms, I guess you would say, of engineering. And he was just, you know, tired of cycling through, you know, not feeling like focused, which one did he want to choose and which one, you know, did, uh, did he want to grow in as far as his career. And, you know, on the one hand, that can sound very boring. Um, but the way that we ended up addressing it was actually going back through the, the arc of his life a little bit. Like, what were you like growing up and what kind of relationship did you have with your siblings and your parents and what kind of, I, I guess you would say, conditioning did you get around what success looks like or what achievement is required? Uh, to be a successful human. And you start to get a sense uh, from these types of questions where people are as far as if you look at like our internal guidance system or intuition, some people basically have an entire life of not listening to that and only listening to external pressure. 
And then other people are somewhere in the middle. And then some people are actually quite good at it. Like they've really listened to themselves, but for whatever reason, um, you know, that something has happened in their life that threw them off track or perhaps they have more responsibilities now and it's not just about them. So they're not used to weighing the needs of other people, for example. And so essentially there's just an interview process where we start to delve into um, kind of what's haunting them. Like what, what is keeping them up at night? What fears do they have about getting another job? Um, and then also, I think on the flip side, what do they think getting a new job will give them? And a lot of times what I end up talking with people about is let's just say you want a new job. And I say, why do you want a new job? And you say, so I can make more money. And I say, well, why do you want to make more money? And then you say, so I can uh, travel. Well, why do you want to travel? So I can experience other places. Well, why do you want to do that? And you start to just delve down to like the root answer mm -hmm. and then once you get closer to that you realize it's usually some fundamental thing right like a of fear fundamental fear of dying too soon or living a life that doesn't matter or a life that's boring or whatever like missing out on something really central um, so then we can work with the idea that there are actually ways that you can tune into that fulfillment that you're seeking in your everyday now and not project all that on getting a job. Hmm. Because essentially what I find is that, you know, the more centered and grounded and um, confident you feel, then you can go into a job search with the idea of, I want to go co-create my life. I'm not looking for this job to solve everything for me. I, you know, have separated it from this fundamental fear that I have because I realize that has to be addressed separately. <laughs> and so anyway, that's an example. I'm not sure if that's helpful. That's for me, that's super helpful. And it makes so much sense. And and one of the tactics that I like to use, uh, and I learned this from 12 steps, sounds like, sounds like what you do with people. I don't know if you're familiar with the 12 step program is, uh, is a step four. It's your character defects. You list out all your character defects and you work with someone else and you get to that fundamental truth and everything that you list out, all your wrongs, all the things that you, are shameful for and what you have guilt around it really all funnels. I like how you use that. It just, you just keep funneling down, funneling down. It's almost like a sales funnel for, for a human being. Uh, and I used to say, it's just this like crazy flow chart and everything comes right back to me. And it's all rooted in fear, fear of economic insecurity, fear of not being loved, fear of not being seen, fear of not showing up, fear of not being uh, useful in society, uh, fear of everything really. And that acronym is false evidence appearing real. So it sounds like you do a lot of detective work and just kind of come down and whittle, 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 whittle on down. And I like that process, you know, why, why do you want more money? So I can travel. Why do you want to travel? Like, what's the experience? And so it sounds like that human on the receiving end is almost unraveling these outcomes that they think they need instead of knowing that they actually have everything they need within them first and everything else that they do within them is a man of, or is in service to what that vision is or what that job is. And it all starts with self. And I think that's a great segue as you touched on like the personal life and the work life. And this is where we share another really beautiful similarity is that personal life and work life for me is really, there's it, they bleed together. They, there's a lot of overlap, 
they they navigate in and out of the lanes you know i'm in the left lane right lane i'm detouring i'm going all in and around and you say personal life and work life are the same life not two separate to-do lists and one thing that i say um when i work with other people or um, talk about my work life when someone asks how it is is that my work day starts when I sit down in my meditation mat and I meditate and I block out the noise and I focus on connecting with source in my higher power. Because if I don't do that first, I'm no good to my team, to myself, my friends, my family, and whoever I'm showing up for in that world. So that's where I don't see much of a difference between work life and personal life. That's my own perspective, but I would love to hear uh, what your perspective is on. It's not two separate to-do lists. I love that. Yeah. Well, again, you know, I think where this really hit home for me was when I was working in healthcare in a cancer center and I, somehow it just, it just really gelled to me that, you know, this idea of a practice where like you have a meditation practice, a yoga practice. Uh, there are many professions that are called a practice, like the practice of law or the practice of medicine. And I think because I was working in medicine, something about that just clicked for me where, you know, a lot of people look at their work day as a sort of a necessary evil. Like I have to get through this so that I can then get the paycheck and do stuff with my kids and whatever else it is, right, that I actually really want to do. And what I started to find again, this theme of instead of resisting the fact that I have to work and the fact that I have to interact with colleagues and patients and stuff and doctors, I started to realize that this is all, every single thing is an opportunity to practice those values that you say you have. So if one of your values is to be compassionate, the workplace offers you infinite opportunities to be compassionate. If you're you know, trying to practice patience or generosity or um, intercultural understanding, or you're trying not to be ageist or you know, any number of things, the workplace is going to provide you so many opportunities to work on your true self, you know, your authenticity and your consistency. So what I often tell people about say something like LinkedIn is when you look at LinkedIn, you wanna show up consistently with a spirit of generosity and uh, authenticity. Well, it's the same thing like basically in the workplace or in your business. Um, so I started to see all these things really not being separate. And when I built this business, I worked, um, I've been working with a coach that, you know, that you're working with too, named Bridgette. Shout out to Bridgette. I really yeah. love embrace the change. Yeah. Embrace change. And, and, you know, the premise there is that literally every aspect of your business can have, um, a basis in social justice and equity and diversity and inclusion. And again, for me, that was a moment where I realized I had separated some of those things um, artificially. You know, like I kind of thought, well, those are my politics and that's separate, you know? And then I realized that actually for my nervous system and for my life, it needs to all be of one fabric. And so I basically now have a business where, you know, with every paying client that I get, I turn around and uh, make a direct cash donation to an organization here called State of the Heart Recovery, which is helping people that have addiction uh, issues and or homelessness. And, you know, it's just interesting. I was talking to somebody else about this the other day where I'm like, I don't even care if it's tax deductible. Because I realized that that's just another way that we've been brainwashed, you know, to think about hoarding our resources. And, uh, you know, so now, you know, every client that pays me, I just turn around and give them money and it literally goes to help clients that week. And, 
somehow that that synergy of helping people you know who are more successful in their careers and typically making you know a hundred thousand dollars or more and turning around and helping people that are living at the you know in the worst most challenging circumstances somehow that all fits together for me as a practice and you know to me i think it has to do with the fact like you were saying that we're about interconnectedness and the dignity that i treat my clients with is the same dignity that i you know make this donation with about these are human beings that are connected to us and with regard to being the sovereign governor of your own experience i really feel like if you're not sovereign and you don't you don't feel empowered and whole it makes it very hard to have harmonious interconnectedness with other people um, so to me working on yourself is basically doing the the world a big favor because <laughs> it makes it easier for you to collaborate and give and not be threatened and not be defensive and you know just basically be clearer um, so that was a bit of a no <laughs> you that was amazing you actually just answered the question i was going to ask you and being a better listener in my day it allowed you to keep flowing with that stream of consciousness and it was around the word sovereignty which is a big word right now a lot of people are using it i think there's a lot of lip service around it there's a little bit of like confusion convolution because it's always been attached to government and politics and imperialism and you use it in such an elegant way and then you tied it into uh being interconnected and that's how i think of sovereignty i think of sovereignty as freedom choice and we're not tethered to big pharma big gov uh, big biz the systemic edge the patriarchal system oppression and it's really about first figuring out who you are and what our order is in universal law so we can be interconnected with everyone we're already interconnected with all humans and all human race and uh, for me i did this meditation the other day and uh, it was really around sovereignty and interconnectedness and how they can actually work together there's it's it's not one or the other and um and how we can ultimately harmonize our relationship with <clears throat> mother earth and the more i can dive into a deep place of meditation and block out the noise of the world the more i feel interconnected with other humans and i have feelings of empathy and cultivate more compassion and i'm someone that's recovering from a lack of compassion for self and others and i can admit that i'm someone that is in recovery from a lack of empathy and learning how to have more empathy but i think right there that fundamental truth of being able to meditate or just be sit still be quiet like you said relax your nervous system allow things to come that's the uh extraterrestrial information i think that's been down it is being downloaded it's not these alien figures it's information um, and that right there big gov the systemic edge capitalism patriarchal system whatever phrase that you want to use to describe it they can't touch that they can't patent it they can't put it up for rent they can't put ip around it that is the one thing that i think is going to get everybody on this earth to rise up and deconstruct some of the systems that have kept all of us um, in place and all of us a little bit confused on what really matters in this life so thank you for really unpacking the word sovereignty and how you see it as uh, empowering yourself with freedom of choice empowering yourself 
with discovering who you really are. So then you can show up in the world. And if more people do that, then we have a really good fighting chance to be able to have the new world that we all want to live in and fully descending into that human experience, not, not ascending away from it. So uh, that, that's what I wanted to say to that. And um, thank you for that because sovereignty we've used at medicine box um, as part of our mission statement. And someone's like, well, are you an anti-vaxxer? No, you can do what you want with yourself. That's the beautiful thing about being sovereign with yourself. So, Go get the vaccination. Don't get the vaccination. You know, eat dirt if that's going to make you feel good about yourself or, you know, drink water all the time, whatever it might be. And um, you touched a little bit on your social impact model. And uh, I, let's, let's talk about, you know, social impact and how you see that as a, uh, a pillar to your business and why all businesses should start with the social impact program. And it's not about, Oh, I'm going to be make a million bucks. I'm going to make 5 million bucks. When I sell my company, I'm going to donate 20% of what I earn to a nonprofit. That's in the future. That's that desired outcome that we're already constructing instead of doing it right now and building it into the fabric of your company. And then I want to open it up for uh, some Q and a, so sure yeah i think i think for me um where where it came down to was you know until i created this social impact approach quite frankly i wasn't that motivated um to promote my business um it it just felt kind of out of sync with uh with everything that's going on in our country and so forth and so once i was able to to sort of specifically name an organization that I really, really want to support and I want to see it help, you know, so many people. And then I also joined the board of an organization called Dress for Success. And because of the way my business is set up, I actually have the time and energy to volunteer and help them grow. And I, and again, this is something where this is just a fresh way of thinking about it for me, like to prioritize my volunteer work as much as my work work. And, you know, to prioritize being able to spend money on things for my family as much as I prioritize making sure that I'm directly giving to an organization pretty much monthly as much as I possibly can through my business growing. And that provided the motivation for me to really get excited. Um, and it gives this extra depth to it that um, I, it's just really, really satisfying. <laughs> and, and quite frankly, the other thing, just getting back again to this idea of interconnectedness, when you're an entrepreneur or a solopreneur, it's very easy to just get lost in your head and to feel like it's all, it's kind of all about you and you're alone. And a huge part of what I'm trying to do is decenter myself in a, in a way that uh, makes it really about how much good can I do? Like how much can I give? Like, and not even necessarily promote it all that much, but just make it a part of my everyday life. And, you know, it really has shifted the whole model uh, to where I have all these relationships, like real relationships with the people at this nonprofit where I know the founders and I know how much blood, sweat, and tears they put into it. I know this woman who's the founder of Dress for Success here. And I, my commitment to do whatever I can to help this organization grow is based on a relationship with her. And so anyways, long story short, for me as an entrepreneur, this has made my success about the success of so many other people. Um, and that is a really motivating factor because it isn't just my clients. It's all these other people that benefit from me having clients. <laughs> so, Your success is everyone else's success. I like how you've so elegantly put that. And the other thing I, you mentioned was practice and the personal and professional life 
is really a place to practice these concepts, whether it's generosity, more compassion, more courage. And that really resonated with me. And uh, Medicine Box's six values, our value system, uh, is based around what I call the six C's. And it's clarity, creativity, courage, compassion, communication, and consciousness. And when I came up with that for Medicine Box, for our values, it was actually a choice that I made in a conversation I had with myself. Like, well, those are the things that I pray for every morning when I get up. I, I ask creator source to guide me through clarity, courage, creativity, compassion, conversation, and consciousness. Well, I shouldn't, I should keep that for myself because that's my personal thing. And you just really helped me validate why I did that because it's, I'm practicing it, right? I was able to, uh, you know, put that into a document and Alana, who's behind the scenes right now, I remember when it really worked, she, she called me, we were on our, one of our Monday calls and uh, she was feeling a little bit stuck. Alana, I'm sharing a real life thing here, st stuck in a creative process. And it was actually what we're doing right now with these, these Zoom casts uh, bi-monthly. And we were working out the flow, the pre-production, post-production. There's a lot that goes into this, everybody. There's a lot. And I want to thank Alana and Justin for behind, behind the scenes, my teammates at Medicine Box. But she's like, you know what I did? I went to that document and I realized and I went right to clarity and I need more clarity. And that was how we were able to navigate through this bottleneck in our system because of that. And so uh, you just validated my intuitive guidance for myself, why I took the things that I pray for every morning as Brian, but then put it into my brand medicine box as Brian, the founder. And really there's no, they're not two separate to-do lists. So I wanted to come back to that because um, anyone that's listening, you know, the things that we do in our, you know, everyday life, if it's not working on our business, it's, we're always nourishing ourselves and rising up into a place of consciousness. And I like to think of it, think of it as, um, as the founder, the operator, entrepreneur, solopreneur, as Marissa mentioned, is we are always putting our job is to just continuously put more consciousness into what we are creating. And we get that from other human beings other experiences for me it's being out in lake tahoe it's skiing it's being in the forest it's being with nature and grounding down into meditation so it's a place of practice not perfection and progress not perfection so marissa thank you i knew this was going to be a fun conversation because when we first spoke we talked a lot about these topics and um it was really great to just connect with someone that has been able to turn uh, such a really traumatic experience. I can't even imagine what it is into something that makes you money, makes impact and creates impact for a wider web of interconnectedness. So uh, everybody, thank you so much. Um, that is uh, the time that we have uh, for now for just the conversation, but um, let's open it up for some the Q and a, or if anyone really wants to just share now we can do some questions and, and actually let's get creative. Let's take one of those six C's and practice, uh, sharing, uh, a question or maybe something that, uh, has been an experience that you've turned into, um, a piece of recovery or used it to uh, wager a bit more strength in your life to create uh, a positive impact. So, and Marissa, if you want to add in anything there, uh, let me know. Um, Bridgette says hi on Facebook live. Hi, Bridgette. If, if anyone is like, who's Bridgette? Bridgette is really, the interconnected weaver of magic that brought Marissa and I together through her coaching program, um, Embrace Change. And 
Uh, she helps with diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. And one of her famous quotes is, don't DIY your DEI. Don't do it yourself, your diversity, equity, inclusion. Do it with other people and professionals that know what they're talking about. So that's Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Waits quote by Alana. Ooh, I love Tom Waits. RIP. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. Beautiful. Yeah. Concentrate on the task. Uh, Bianca. Mm -hmm. Is Bianca, is that high society mama Bianca? That's the only Bianca I know. But thank you both and your team so much for sharing yourselves with us today. I have been on a seven year journey to be the best version of myself, exclamation point, hoorah. It has been emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical. LinkedIn and Mind Valley have been so wonderful. Mind Valley is the meditation app, I believe. So I can show up as my true self and align, connected to everything, attached to nothing. Mm -hmm. um, that's awesome. Well, and I, I thought of you actually this afternoon because I heard a quote uh, from Eric Clapton, who, oh, yeah, yeah, he became sober, I guess, not too long ago. And he was reflecting on his life and how prior to sobriety, basically, he had no time for responsibility, like, and now he, he's basically saying, you know, I'm responsible for creating my life, like I'm responsible for confronting my fears. And, and so for him, even though I think he just turned 76 or something, he, he says, I'm not a grown up yet, but I'm on my way. And I really love it. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I, I took away from that, you know, something I wanted to share with, with anybody who's listening, which is to say, Sometimes we make jokes about how hard it is to be an adult and responsibility and, you know, it's just so boring and so forth. But honestly, on the other side of, of embracing responsibility as a, as, a, as a person, that's where you start to really grow. Because as long as you're projecting and saying, well, it's, it's the fault of my employer because they're so awful or I hate my job and my life sucks you're basically externalizing your locus of control but once you can start to bring that further into yourself and own your own responsibility and some people play with that word and call it response ability like your ability to respond to your life and it allows you more freedom to um co-create that life instead of just reacting to it mm -hmm. you know so I think about that a lot because it's so easy to fall into that trap and it's so common um but honestly it's it's pretty miserable so super miserable then yeah. one of my advisors uh said it so elegantly once you know no one's coming here to save us we have to save ourselves first. And there's been a lot of times in my life where I've, you know, kind of rested on my laurels and thought that, you know, people around me, friends, family, you know, my fellowship, my community, they're here to save me. And I, you know, I can just kind of skate by and do a little bit like I did and excelled through high school and college. It's like, just did a little, uh, just enough to get by and got straight A's. But, you know, if I excelled a little bit more, maybe I could have done more. And that, that was a great lesson to learn that like, no, you know, we're not here to find ourselves. We're here to create ourselves and co-create. Love that you put the co there. Well, and, it, basically no job, no job description or anything could ever ask of you that which you're uniquely created to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're just waiting for people to appreciate you and waiting for the perfect job, you're going to be really disappointed repeatedly. But if you start to say this job is just the job description is just a place to start. And mm -hmm. I'm the one that builds up to excellence from here. I'm the one who brings my unique spin to this. Then it's a whole different game. Like it's a much more um, 
much more engaging way to approach things um, and not going through the motions, like being present, actually showing up, that changes the energy, right, of whatever it is that you're doing. And the more you can participate and be alive in what you're doing now, the greater likelihood that you're going to find something that is satisfying to you, whatever the next thing is. Um, That's awesome. And just to leave our guests with some more words of wisdom by Marissa, you know, what, what could be one simple additive or ritual or routine that someone can add to their daily life like right now that might help them get to that place? What do you think it could be? It's just simple, just a simple thing for free, no frills. Huh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, because I do think people throw out things like, oh, you should start meditating or you need to journal or you, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I feel like sometimes that can backfire because people that are already feeling down on themselves and like they don't measure up, they start doing those things and then they feel like they're failing at that too. Mm. So I think, I think the thing that I would leave with people is to say, you don't have to suffer as much as you're suffering. So you can have compassion for other people. You can have empathy. You can want your life to be different. And you do not have to suffer while doing those things. So I think that's just really important to, to recognize that some of it, you can just let it go. Mm. You know, because so much of our culture in our society, whether it's about losing weight or it's about, you know, changing who you are, so much of it is guilt and shame. Like you're not there yet. And until you're like this, you're not okay. And I think where I come at it is stop it. Like, just stop that. Like, there's no way you can feel bad enough to change the world. It's only the more you start to feel good that you're going to do good. So, you know, just realize that, that you can release this idea that you deserve to suffer. Um, Amazing. I hold to that. The Dalai Lama would be proud. He does not want suffering in this world. So on to the next steps as much as I'd love to continue talking. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up and sticking with us. Uh, Richard, talk to me, guy, if you can hear me. Thank you, man, uh, for showing up. Richard has his own radio show over in uh, Sonoma County and interviewed me. Uh, probably like 18 months ago. So it's always nice to see people pop up on here that I haven't seen in a while. So uh, next steps, um, all attendees uh, who entered will be put into a drawing to win a free, aka free career consultation with your career concierge, Marissa, as well as the full suite of one cab products uh, from Medicine Box. That is equanimity for sleep, happy belly for gut health and vital recovery for overall vitality and that clear, sustained focus energy that we all need, a prize worth over $250. Uh, contact there, there's me, Brian, at medicinebox.green, uh, and Marissa, clarity at your con career concierge.com. And interested in our Wellness Muse um, program, you can email Alana there at medicineboxwellness.com or affiliates at medicineboxwellness.com and sign up for an affiliate. It's super easy. It takes you about 30 minutes at most. You get your own unique link. Uh, lots of fun perks to join the Medicine Box uh, ever growing and evolving community. I think we have 75 and counting right now. And any product that you sell, uh, you get 15% um, commission on that. And we have a pretty all-star uh, person that manages that, and that's Lana back there. And I think our top salesperson has done like almost 
a little over five thousand dollars so far selling you know a few units at a time so it's a fun group to be a part of and i uh, hope you all can join that and um, always check us out at medicineboxwellness.com and um, marissa's website's down there your career concierge and we'll be sending um, some show notes and blogs and sizzle reels and audiograms out on all our social channels and uh, please share with your friends uh, we'll be doing this twice a month and be stay stay tuned for um, the next uh, event that we have planned uh, coming up here in April. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank and you, Marissa. Thanks, thanks for everybody. joining, and thank you, everybody. Good to see y'all. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.